I think it's important. We're, we're talking about the relationship of Iraq and Iran, which is a kind of organic relationship. They're very close, have been very close. Uh, if you talk to an Iraqi and they'll tell you about you know, the problems they've had in the tourist industry, uh, you might be surprised if there are tourists who go to Iraq. And uh, lo and behold, the tourists who go to Iraq, who visit Najaf and Kabbalah, Nasiriyah, another place I was at, they're all from Iran. And these are all Shia shrines in Iraq that if you're an Iranian, this is very important to you, and you show up there. And so, uh, it's, uh, so you see these busloads of Iranian tourists coming into Iraq, and you see, think, well, wait a minute, did we liberate Iraq from this Sunni dictatorship in order to allow them to once again have a close relationship with Iran? Well, the short answer is yes, we did. And uh, that's something that we might have given a little more thought to uh, before we uh, invaded in 2003. In fact, these are two countries that have a close relationship. Uh, not only for the fact that they're neighbors. And by the way, in international relations, whenever you talk about does someone like someone, et cetera, check a map first, because often neighbors, that's a special relationship, often especially bad, but can be specially good. And so uh, this relationship between these two countries is rather endlessly fascinating. I always thought that Iraq, which is about 60%, to look at the basic demography of Iraq, You've got 20% Kurds, you've got 20% Arab, Sunni Arabs, which is like the rest of the Middle East, which is some 95% Sunni Arabs, and then you have 20%, then you have 60% uh, uh, Shia. So it's much more Shia, three times as many Shia, um, Arab Shia as there are Arab Sunni. And um, it's different in that regard. And if you look around the whole map of the Middle East, you'll see that there are very few countries with a uh, Shia majority. If you look at Kuwait, they've got about 40% Shia, Arab Shia. And uh, if you look at Bahrain, it's more like 80% Arab Shia. And then when you look at the rest of the Arab world, it's pretty small. In Saudi Arabia, the Shia population is, is less than 10%, maybe more like 5%. But it's important, 5% in Saudi Arabia, Arabia, because if you look at where they are, they're in a part of Saudi Arabia called the East Province. And the East Province in Saudi Arabia is where all the oil is. So where you have oil in Saudi Arabia, you have Shia living there. And so the Saudis have looked over at this at this uh, installation, really, of Shia power in Iraq. Uh, and they are worried because if the Shia succeed in Baghdad, the Shia, who have not been particularly uh, political in Saudi Arabia, uh, might get ideas from the Shia in Iraq to kind of say, well, now, wait a minute, what makes the East Province part of Saudi Arabia? Who determined that? So, there's a lot of concern in the Arab world about Shia Iraq. Very concerned that somehow these are not going to be loyal, um, loyal Arabs. And especially concerned that as the years have, have, uh, have gone by after the American, um, American intervention there, the Iraqis and the Iranians with tourism and a lot of other things are a lot closer than they ever were before. So there's a lot to be concerned about. Now, I Iran um, is a very dominant Shia country, although we know that uh, Persians are also have, uh, they have a lot of these small sects in, uh, in Iran, such as Sufis. I mean, people have heard of Sufis. Uh, they, have, um, they have some Sunnis as well in, in Iran, very much a, uh, a minority. And, and they've got um, uh, some of these very small groups there's something called the Mujahideen el Khalq, the Mech. And uh, where are the Mech now? Well, the Mech are actually, they were a uh, they're believer in this very cultish thing. And uh, when, the, when the Ayatollahs took over Iraq, oh, took over Iran, and by the way, half the time I'm going to say Iraq when I mean Iran, but I'll try to control it. Uh, when, the, uh, when the Ayatollahs came in and took over I Iran, the, the Mech, who were a very um, 
you know, this very small uh, kind of dissident group, not, certainly not Shia and certainly not Sunni, the Iranians started going after them, and it turned out the Mech eventually resettled in, in Iraq. So there are a bunch of uh, Iranians living in Iraq. Now, Saddam Hussein saw that he was, these people were ferociously opposed to the uh, Ayatollahs. So when Saddam waged that seven-year war during the 1980s, one of his major tank uh, uh, brigades was, the, these were Iranians, refugees from Iran who have now, who turned on, on Iran and fought in Saddam Hussein's army. I mention that because occasionally you will see, you will hear uh, Americans say, you know, uh, not every Iranian supports Iran. There are a lot of people who are real dissidents, for example, the Mujahideen al Kalk, and if only we would support them, they could somehow go back to Iran and somehow liberate it from the, uh, from the Ayatollah. I would argue to you this is a little like listening to people talk about China in the late 40s, saying that surely Chiang Kai-shek, who by that time had uh, beaten a hasty retreat to uh, uh, Taiwan, surely he has the, the capacity, if we only arm him and encourage him, he'll go back into China and uh, once again reconquer China and get rid of the communists. So you hear this stuff about the Mujahideen al Kalk that they are going to come back in and they would be the sort of vanguard of, a, of an effort on our part to somehow overthrow this, uh, um, this, uh, this mulatocracy, as it's, uh, as it's known. And I would just encourage you to look askance at anyone who says something like that and say, you've got to be kidding, because it's not happening. It is not happening at all. The Mujahideen al kalk though, in, in Iraq, I remember talking to the, um, uh, to the leadership in Iraq, a delightful guy named Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, and uh, Maliki wanted to throw these people back into Iran. I said, no, no, they're good friends of ours. And uh, they, of course, weren't good friends of ours because they have been known to have their own view on everything, including uh, killing Americans. Uh, and for that, they were properly uh, known as or, or designated as a terrorist group. And it really wasn't until just a few years ago when Hillary Clinton was, uh, was uh, Secretary of State that we decided they were not a terrorist group. They have a lot of friends in the U.S. And they're not a terrorist group in the, because somehow they're going to, uh, to uh, help us in our effort against Iran. They're, that's not happening. I mention this because for many Americans, Iran is a, is a place that has uh, really uh, been, had a major political factor in the U.S. Now, the Iranians like to push back the clock to 1953, 1954, when the CIA did engage in a coup d'etat and got the Shah and his family into, uh, into power. Uh, but from, the, um, from our perspective, what do we remember about Iran? We remember about the effort to take, uh, to uh, their successful effort to overthrow the Shah and to put in this very, uh, the Islamic Republic, and especially for Americans, they then they went to our embassy and held our, um, our uh, diplomats hostage, subjected them to, uh, I mean, this was pretty wild stuff. They took our, our, our diplomats, held them for 444 days. Uh, they um, su uh, subjected them to mock executions, that is, they would come into their, uh, where they're detaining them, and they would blindfold them and say, say your prayers, and then they'd take them into the embassy compound, and then they would fire uh, blanks at them, and of course the diplomats realize, oh my God, I'm still alive, and then they would all laugh and think that's hilarious, and then they'd do it again, and, and so at a certain point, uh, the American people, I, can, I think quite rightly, said, uh, just as the Ayatollah's people would say, death to America, we are on the other side of that, that we are sick of the Iranians. And this, um, when the Iranians uh, had that war that I alluded to earlier with, uh, with Iraq, it was kind of tough for the US. We were more sort of on the side of Iraq, um, although Saddam Hussein uh, was, we could tell he was a pretty brutal guy, and later on we saw how brutal when he uh, invaded, tried to 
turn Kuwait into another province in Iraq. So, um, but in the 80s, I remember Henry Kissinger famously said, well, I want both of them to lose. And that's basically, basically what happened. But for many Americans, the idea of going after the Iranians kind of appealing, given what Iran had, uh, had done to our country. I mean, whatever one thinks about Jimmy Carter, they basically humiliated the presidency of Carter. It never recovered. And in fact, he lost the election hugely after only one term. And it was basically because of, the, because of what Iran had, uh, had done to us. So a lot of very ill will in the US toward Iran, and for good reason. Now, you would have thought that as we, uh, as we went to war with Saddam Hussein in what's now called the Gulf War in 1991, you would have thought that given that the Iranians had absolutely no affection for the Sunni leader of Iraq, and remember the basic uh, demo demography, that Iraq is a Shia uh, majority country, and yet it had this Sunni leader who was basically supported by the rest of the Arab world. But he had misbehaved. He went into uh, Kuwait and he tried to make it another province. And the Saudis and others supported the effort by George Herbert Walker Bush to expel uh, uh, Saddam's forces from, from uh, Kuwait. And you recall that was a pretty brilliant uh, military effort on our part. We had uh, Norman uh, Schwarzkopf, who was the, our general, who, remember, had this famous uh, left hook where he moved up the coast and then swung around through the desert, uh, completely catching the uh, Saddam's army by surprise. At one point, they tried to pull out of uh, Kuwait. We basically didn't let them. We hit the first vehicle in the column. We hit the last vehicle in the column. And then we killed everybody who was involved in it, about 100 vehicles. And we killed every Iraqi soldier involved in it. It's called the highway to death. And um, you recall maybe at the time that uh, uh, Colin Powell, uh, then the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, had gone to uh, President, uh, uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush and said, this is not chivalrous. We have to stop this. And the president, so the story goes, ag agreed. And, and that was kind of the end of the war. And we ended up uh, um, having a peace with, uh, with Saddam. Now, one of the questions many of Bush's critics had, and mainly on, by the way, the Republican Party side, was, hey, you had an open road to Baghdad and you left this thug in charge in Baghdad? Why didn't we go in there and take, uh, take out Saddam Hussein and put a democratic government in there? And uh, a lot of this criticism of, uh, uh, that included, uh, uh, belatedly, frankly, from uh, uh, Secretary of Defense Cheney. It also included a guy named Paul Wolfowitz, who was uh, very much in this sort of ilk that somehow we had missed an opportunity to take out this miserable dictator, and why did we do that? Well, there was a comment at the time by someone who supported President Bush's decision not to uh, march on Baghdad, and that was a guy named James Baker, uh, his uh, Secretary of Defense, his Secretary of State. And, um, and Baker had made the point, he made it publicly, he said, the coalition will not hold. And so people thought, well, OK, yeah, the Saudis are a little squeamish about this, but we can encourage them to be with us again. And surely they'll want to uh, get rid of this terrible guy, Saddam, except they didn't. And so what's going on there? Because the Saudis were very much in favor of us liberating Kuwait and very much in favor of us protecting Saudi Arabia, and yet not in favor of finishing the job. What was going on? Well, I don't think we understood it at the time, but the Saudis sure did. And what they understood was, if you go into Sunni-led but Shia-dominated Iraq, and you tell the uh, Iraqis, or you get rid of Saddam, and you put in some kind of democratic, pro uh, uh, democratic process that will result in some kind of election, what's going to happen? Well, there are no civil society there. There's no concept of one party wants big government, the other party doesn't, or something. What would happen is the majority of the Iraqis, who are Shia, would vote for Shia leadership, 
and the minority of Iraqis are Sunni would lose, and you would have a Shia-led Iraq. And so the Saudis said, don't go in there. They didn't really explain why, but they said, don't do it. And so this kind of this issue in American politics sort of festered from 1991, 92. Why didn't we finish the job, et cetera? So fast forward 10 years later, you have 9-11. Um, you have and, uh, and then you had many Americans, including some of the same people who were kind of on the losing side of that argument back in 91, Dick Cheney, Paul Wolfowitz, saying, you know, we need to establish for the Arab world that a democracy can work. And they looked at Iraq, which, frankly speaking, was we know, and we know clearly, was not involved in 9-11. If there's any country that had some fingerprints on it, it was Saudi Arabia, not Iraq. But we had people who, uh, who felt that, you know, Iraq has a middle class. It's been suppressed by this terrible leader. We'll get rid of Saddam and Iraq will become a kind of successful middle-class-led country. And so they carried the day. Now, did Cheney know the difference between Sunni and Shia? I submit to you, he did not. And, um, you know, I guess the students have gone to study their homework. Cheney never did his homework. And frankly, Paul Wolfowitz, who fashioned himself a great intellectual on uh, the Middle East, hadn't done his homework because what happened was we created a Shia-led Iraq. And meanwhile, over um, just a little west of, uh, just a little east, rather, of, uh, of Iraq, you had a Shia-led uh, uh, Iran saying, thank you, Americans. You have now given us the buffer state that we've wanted for a long time. You've created a buffer between us and, uh, and the Sunni world. Now. Saudis were pretty hopping mad about this. They were furious at George W. Bush for listening to people who were essentially playing out an American political argument rather than a uh, strategic issue in the Middle East. And so the Saudis uh, said to the, uh, to the uh, Bush administration, why did you do that? You've created a terrible situation for us, and I thought we were your friends. Well. This went on for some time as the Americans continued to try to help Iraq, uh, to try to have it more democratic. Turns out not all these Shia leaders were nice guys. And uh, I think you've heard me say before that, you know, if this, uh, that the Shia leadership coming in, sort of like majority rule in uh, South Africa, they had a 20% problem, the 20% problem being the Sunni, Sunni Arabs, just as these South Africans had a 20% problem being the white South Africans. But Nelson Mandela wanted those white South Africans to stay, and he kind of used his charisma and reached out to the white South Africans. The Shia leadership, you know, under a guy like Maliki, and I always like to say if he ever had charisma, it cleared up a long time ago. And so, so Maliki never did this outreach to the Sunni community. And it was sort of my way or the highway. But I think it's important to understand the Sunni community in Iraq never wanted to do outreach to Maliki. Why would a small minority, 20%, feel that they should, uh, uh, they should be able to reject the vast majority, the 60% Shia. And by the way, I should add the Kurds, who are another 20%. Kurds are Kurds. And occasionally, you'll hear Sunni Arabs in Iraq say, well, we're 40%. You know, that's not inconsiderable, 40%. Well, that sounds nice, except that uh, they're counting the 20% Kurds, 20% of the total population, as Sunnis. And Kurds do tend to be Sunnis. But a Kurdish Sunni is very different from, an, uh, from a, uh, an Arab Sunni, and the Kurds have never lined up with the Arab Sunnis. If anything, they've lined up with the Arab Shia. So the Sunnis were, were they're far more Shia than there were Sunni. And so the Sunnis kind of felt they had this, this sort of strength going back, you know, this strategic depth, I should say, going all the way back to Morocco because the Arabs are all, are all Sunnis. Meanwhile, the Saudis are particularly perturbed at what's happened. They have they've blocked Iraq from getting into the Arab, various Arab councils, even though they're Arabs. Uh, 
And uh, they're particularly, they were particularly upset at this decision by George W. Bush and particularly upset at, at, uh, at Barack Obama for continuing to support this Shia-led country in, in Iraq. And then along comes uh, uh, President Trump. Now, you recall the first country that President Trump visited was not you know, London or England or, or France. He went to Saudi Arabia. And uh, what he found was a Saudi population that was furious at the Americans for having supported Shia and had become even more, more furious when the Americans began a, or joined with the Europeans in a negotiation to deal with Iran's nuclear issue. Now, you could say, well, maybe the Saudis just felt that uh, the, uh, the Iranians were lying about the nuclear weapons, et cetera, and probably they do think the Iranians were lying about nuclear weapons. But their real concern was they remember back in the 1970s when the US, they had one big strategic partner in the Middle East, and it wasn't uh, the Saudis, uh, it was the Shah of Iran. So they saw in, in, uh, two th in 2013, 14, what they saw was the Americans once again finding their old dance partner, the Iranians, and starting to do things with the Iranians and leaving the Saudis out. And so the Saudis were furious at, uh, at, at uh, uh, President Bush for, first of all, for turning Iran, Iraq into a Shia-led country, and furious with uh, Barack Obama for beginning to engage the Iranians. They could not accept this idea. Along comes President Trump, and he says, well, we're getting out of that deal with Iran. And the Saudis were delighted. And basically, anything the Saudis said uh, President Trump agreed with. Now, was there a method to this? Did, he, did President Trump just think the, the uh, uh, Saudis happened to be right on, on everything? No. What it was was the, the Trump, and especially his, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, felt that if you're going to solve the Israel-Palestine issue, if you're going to create a circumstance where the Palestinians finally understand that the game is up. They're not going to get support from the Arab world. They're going to have to make their peace with, with Israel. And frankly, they're going to have to accept a lot less than they thought has been on offer for a long time. That is the, the, um, the left, ba the, uh, left bank, the, uh, the uh, West Bank. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why I brought Paris into this. but uh, uh, So... When they, so the problem, of course, that has bedeviled Israel is they've not had a real negotiating partner with the Palestinians. The Palestinians have kind of pocketed the idea that the West Bank would be a new Palestinian state and wanted to insist, as they did in the Camp David uh, effort, to have a uh, uh, so-called right of return. That is, people who are kicked out of what is today Israel proper would be able to go back there and you'd have a whole demographic change and frankly you wouldn't have Israel at that point. So uh, the, that has been sort of what the Palestinians were looking for with the thought that all over the world they, were, they had been supported in, in creating a West Bank state. And uh, so President Trump had a different thought that if, they, if you could cut them off from Arab support, namely Saudi support, the Saudis having paid all the bills for the Palestinians for a long time, the Palestinians might understand the game is up and they've got to support uh, whatever Jared Kushner uh, came up with. Well, it was a pretty, uh, pretty hard, hardball politics, and uh, lo and behold, uh, it, uh, it did kind of weaken the Saudi support to the, um, to the Palestinians. You recall early on in the Trump administration, he did something that the Isra Israelis have wanted US administrations for many years to do. He recognized that the Israeli uh, capital is Jerusalem. And uh, that should have been pretty shocking to the Arab world, yet the Saudis, you know, they kind of did the junior college try in terms of uh, objecting, but not much more than that. So from, from Trump's perspective, he had gained, he felt he had gained this ally 
and, uh, and that that ally would be willing to kind of jam Fatah, the, uh, the main Palestinian player in the uh, Palestine Authority, and marginalize Hamas, the Palestinians who are in the Gaza Strip. Well, you know, as we know, um, just a few weeks ago, Jared Kushner unveiled his, uh, his peace plan. It uh, was heavy on pages, 182 pages, but um, it was unveiled with President Bush and uh, Netanyahu, whose corruption trial starts next week. Uh, there are essentially no Palestinians and no Arabs in the room. I think a couple of the ambassadors from the United Arab Emirates maybe come, but that was about it. And so it was an effort really to, uh, to create a, uh, a sort of the reality that the uh, Palestinians were going to have to accept. It was all based on the idea that whatever the Saudis want, we're going to say yes because we need their help with Palestine. Well, if there's one thing that the Arab Spring taught us, or uh, the Arab thing, as I like to call it, because we have no idea what it really was, if there's one thing that we learned from that is that the problems of the Middle East are not all about Israel. And what we could see from the Arab Spring was that uh, there were a lot of problems within the Arab world in terms of local leadership. A lot of um, the countries that... Uh, uh, or the, the groups that were more successful in, the, in kind of seizing power tended to be the more religious groups, and we saw that with the Muslim Brotherhood in, uh, in uh, Egypt uh, seizing power and eventually losing it to a military coup. But uh, we saw that this, this kind of picture in, in the Middle East was quite complex and wasn't necessarily according to the organizing principles that we always thought uh, applied. Namely, we support Israel, we have a peace process, we have lines of communication to the Palestinians, we have a, Saudi, a reluctant partner in Saudi Arabia. So none of this really applied. So what began to happen, though, is that um, the Trump administration um, fulfilled a promise essentially made to the Saudis and to a lot of people in this country that they would get out of this joint action plan, the so-called JCPOA, with the, with the Iranians. Now, in retrospect, when President Obama uh, uh, instructed uh, Secretary of State Kerry to get this done, it was pretty clear that there was a lot of uh, upset in the Republican-led uh, houses of uh, Congress. Uh, one of the issues, of course, was that the Israelis under Netanyahu were opposed to any deal with the, uh, with the uh, um, Iranians, with Netanyahu also thinking that the Saudis don't like this deal, and I, Netanyahu, I need the Saudis to be very supportive, and the only way I'm going to get them to, get them to be supportive is if uh, I also oppose any deal-making with the, with the Iranians. But we, uh, we also saw in the, in the Congress, in fact, the Congress, they invited Netanyahu to speak, and this was rather remarkable to have a prime minister of Israel come and criticize the American president in Washington in a joint session of Congress. I mean, I don't think it's ever been uh, done before, and I suspect it won't be done after the Trump administration, whenever that is, but uh, it was uh, pretty unusual. So, um, in the mean, so in the meantime, uh, the Congress kind of riled itself up opposed to the JCPOA. Now, what was the main objection to the JCPOA? First of all, they said, look, if you're going to do a treaty, Constitution is pretty clear. There needs to be two-thirds majority in the Senate, and you haven't even asked our opinion about anything, which was correct. And it was correct, the, the, the Obama administration said, look, it's, a, it's, a, it's an agreement we've made, an executive agreement. Executive agreements don't require two-thirds majorities, only uh, uh, legal treaties do. In fact, I think they made it an executive agreement rather than a legal treaty because they knew the, Trump, the, uh, the Obama administration knew there was no way they were going to get... Uh, support in Congress for it. So one thing they just got them on was the technicality of not going to Congress. Another issue was, of course, hey, the Iranians are already up to their necks in problems in Syria. Uh, 
We don't like ISIS, and by the way, neither does Iran, ISIS being an extreme Sunni group, and one of the reasons Iran is there is they don't want more, more extreme Sunni groups. They don't mind extreme Shia groups, but they don't want extreme Sunni groups. So um, the Iranians were very much, uh, very much engaged in, in, uh, in the issue of Syria, and we seem to address nothing about this. So why hadn't the Obama administration said, okay, we've got the JCPOA, why don't we now try to get Iran to vacate Syria? And the answer was, if they're going to start talking about arrangements, political and sectarian arrangements in the Middle East, guess who wanted to be a part of that? The Saudi Arabians. And guess what the Europeans felt about enlarging the process and bringing the Saudis to the table? They were not amused. They basically said, look, Americans, Saudi Arabia, we can deal with that some other time, but we need to get this nuclear stuff done so that we can get the sanctions put aside and we can have a, kind of, a, we can start bringing Iran into the family of nations. Well, a lot of people, especially Republicans in the Congress, didn't believe, didn't believe that that was the case and uh, essentially didn't, uh, they, they wanted Saudi Arabia at the table no one else did from the rest of the world, the Chinese, the Russians, no one wanted the Saudis there. So again, it, was, it contributed to this sense of uh, that somehow the treaty was, was illegal. So when um, President Trump then pulled us out of the treaty, then the question is, what are we going to do? What's plan B? Well, plan B seemed to be to try to slap on sanctions again. And uh, the problem is that sanctions from the U.S. were not a big part of the equation. So the president uh, essentially tried to say, because mo most, dollar, most uh, oil transactions, all oil, almost all oil transactions are done in U.S. dollars, they said to the Europeans, you, can't, you have to join us in these renewed sanctions, which the Europeans didn't want to do, but the Trump administration said, as long as you're using dollars, you're going to have to do it. Rather threatening to our allies and put our European allies in a position of saying, look, I mean, you are using extraterritorial, extraterritoriality by taking, uh, by taking the fact that trades in oil are done in dollars and trying to use that politically against us. So what we found as he, as he tried to pull us out or has pulled us out of the, uh, the uh, joint plan of action with the, with the Iranians created enormous problems with the Europeans. And so um, President Trump, I think, came to understand that this may be a big problem. Now, he had his Secretary of State who um, reflected deep-seated feelings in the U.S. military against the Iranians. After all, we go into Iraq to liberate uh, essentially Shia, and we start getting shot at by these Shia militia groups who are the, actually the ones being supplied by the Iranians. And so uh, you can you bet the American uh, military was not amused by, by the Iranian uh, efforts within, uh, within Iraq. I personally, I was in uh, Nasiriya in June uh, 2009, and I talked to the, uh, to the uh, provincial, the DCAR provincial assembly uh, there. I get back in my car to head out to uh, Talil Air Base, and um, lo and behold, they, uh, a Shia group supported by the Iranians called the Promise Day Brigade tried to blow up my car. I mean, they had a cell phone detonated bomb and it hit in front of my car rather than under my car, came out of a pile of garbage. And before you criticize the root clearance teams, you have to know how many piles of garbage there are in Nasiriya. Uh, looks like uh, you know, a city that has had a garbage strike or something. Uh, so uh, I, I'm alive, but you, know, you don't feel very kindly toward those Shia groups supported by Iran. So a lot of military people, and by the way, some of us as well, and I think uh, uh, our Secretary of State, uh, Pompeo, very much uh, is very anti-Iranian because of the sense of betrayal. We go in to, deliver, to liberate these Shia, these people oppressed, and lo and behold, they start blowing us up. And so um, not a lot of kind feelings toward the Iranians. 
Nonetheless, I think the president kind of understood that this is causing a lot of problems with our European allies. This is causing problems all over the place, problems with China as well, problems with Russia. So the president, I think, began to sort of look around for what could be done. Now, you remember the uh, G7 meeting or, uh, in, in France and uh, what Macron who had who is whose country is very much dependent on Iranian or had become dependent on Iranian oil, he Macron invited uh, uh, the Iranian foreign minister Javed Zarif, our own University of Denver educated Javed Zarif, to come to the G7 meeting in France and prepare for a possible meeting with Trump. Well. President, because he sensed that Trump wanted a way out of this wilderness, but uh, he, I think, exaggerated the degree to which Trump wanted a way out. Moreover, uh, Macron didn't understand the politics in the U.S., where you got a whole Republican Party opposed to doing anything with the Iranians, a view that somehow our sanctions are working, we're starving children, that's working. Uh, as if starving children are now going to be able to overthrow the Ayatollah. That's not working. So um, in any event, the meeting didn't take place. In uh, September, uh, with Pompeo still throwing the book at the, at the Iranians, and uh, in fact doing things like the, uh, uh, the Iranian ambassador to the UN has a serious case of stomach cancer, uh, he was appointed by, to that position by Javed Zarif, and so Pompeo would not allow Javed Zarif to go to the hospital and visit his friend dying of stomach cancer. So we're in that kind of territory here. So, um, so in, um, in early September, I get a uh, call from some American NGO asking me if I'd like to participate in a track two discussion with Javed Zarif. So, uh, I think most of you know the term track two. It's the idea of governments can't really get along, so why don't we have non-governmental people get along, uh, talk, have conversations, because surely they can work things out in a better way than the government can. So I said to this guy, sure, I'm happy to talk to uh, Zarif. Uh, who else will, co will come with me? Who, who do you have for a team? And he said, well, you're it. And, and, so I said, oh, OK, uh, so you want me to go and just have a conversation with Javed Zarif? And he said, yeah, and, uh, and I'll take good notes, and we'll share them with the State Department and elsewhere. And I said, OK. So, so Zarif, myself, and about 150 uh, FBI agents listening through the walls uh, sat down. And uh, Zarif explained to me, he said, look, uh, these sanctions are hurting us. You're correct about that. They're hurting us. But uh, we are not going to uh, uh, sit down with President Trump unless uh, he's prepared to do away with these sanctions. And if he's prepared to do that, uh, we're prepared to um, take the, the, yearly, the year limits on fissile material, which are now in the sort of eight eight to year, eight to 10 year basis, that is they will not make fissile bomb making material for eight to 10 years. We're prepared to take the Ayatollah's fatwa against nuclear weapons, put that in the, in the majlis, the Iranian National Assembly, and make it law that there will be, that we will never, in, a, in, in perpetuity, will never um, uh, spin uh, centrifuges and create uh, fissile material, that's one. Two, we're prepared to have a region-wide discussion on missiles with an idea, with a goal of reducing any um, long-range or intermediate-range missiles in the equation. Three, we are prepared to uh, talk to the Houthi in Yemen and uh, get the Houthi to cut it to stop this war. And uh, provided we can agree ahead of time on what the map of Yemen would look like, it would essentially be going back to d a divided Yemen, uh, a North Yemen and a South Yemen, as there was before uh, a few years ago. Um, and so there was one other point four. But anyway, um, Zarif uh, told me, he said, but we're not prepared to have a situation where um, we meet with Trump, and then he walks away from the deal, uh, 
and says, I need to talk to whoever he needs to advise, I don't know, Sean Hannity or someone. And, uh, and uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, the Iranians have violated what they said. They said, we won't talk to him unless the sanctions are lifted. And of course, they would be talking to him when the sanctions are, are uh, still in place. But if he was willing, if they knew in advance that his he, he uh, had a, an agreement that would be held in escrow, because I went through this all uh, with Zarif, uh, they would be prepared to have the conversation, provided the conversation ends with the end of sanctions and then these other three things that the Iranians uh, would do. But uh, their concern was they didn't trust President Trump to meet with them and then lift the sanctions. Um, I talked to him about some of the things we've done in the past, like I dealt with the Greeks and Macedonians. The Greeks wouldn't meet unless the sanctions were in place. The Macedonians wouldn't meet unless the sanctions were lifted. And so I got them to agree to a five hour, what I called elaborate signing ceremony, and we'd put it in New York. So given the time change, uh, no one would remember whether the sanctions were in place in the morning or lifted in the afternoon, et cetera. And uh, Zarif was amused by that. <laughs> And then he said, but you weren't dealing with Donald Trump. And I said, no, I wasn't. That's true. So uh, where does it stand? It looks like uh, right now, uh, if someone really wanted to get something from the Iranians and um, uh, get back on the track where they don't uh, engage in nuclear weapons, that track may still be open. But in the meantime, of course, what happened since uh, the fall, when a lot of this was going on, is there was a guy named Qasem Soleimani. He is not some guy uh, you know, living in a cave somewhere. He's a senior Iraq, Iranian uh, uh, military leader. He's in charge of uh, support to various pro-Iranian militia groups, including the Houthis in, uh, in uh, um, Yemen, but also the uh, the various uh, Shia groups in Iraq, and also he's been in charge of the Iranian effort to help uh, to keep Bashar al-Assad in power and to get rid of the, um, and to help uh, get rid of ISIS. To understand the fight against ISIS is to understand a coalition of the US, very heavily involved in it, with a lot of close air support, various Kurdish groups, and various Iranian-backed uh, Shia militia groups. Those are the three elements that caused ISIS to be defeated. And so uh, Qasem Soleimani was very active in, 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 in Yemen and Syria and in Iraq itself. So, so active that there are those who argue that he is a, he's a brutal man, no question. I mean, no question he has blood on his hands. And so no question some of that blood is our blood, an American blood. I mean, the feeling is that with his control of those Shia groups, none of them would have attacked U.S. bases without his, his say-so. So what began to happen back uh, a month or two ago was there was more attacks on American uh, bases. And as someone who, you know, I was in, um, in the Green Zone in the American Embassy, and there was a place called uh, Sadr City, which is uh, used to be just considered a big, uh, slum. People would talk about sort of socioeconomic differences. Uh, you know, Sadr City, oh yeah, that's where poor people are. Today, of course, it's the socioeconomic situation is the same. That's still where poor people are, but it's also considered that's the Shia hotbed in, uh, uh, of Shia radicalism in, uh, in Baghdad. So what would happen is you would have these uh, Katusha, or if you've seen World War II movies of Stalin uh, firing these, uh, these uh, banks of uh, rockets called Katusha rockets, and they would uh, you know, hit the German positions, et cetera. Well, these Katushas are, uh, in the Middle East are, are made by a lot of local groups or local uh, countries, including Iran. So the Katushas that were being fired out of the greed zone out of the uh, Sadr city toward the green zone were Iranian made. So what would happen is you're walking along the, uh, you're um, in the embassy, which is about a 104 acre site with you know, a lot of buildings. And then every, oh, I'd say about every 25 yards, 
you see a little sort of bunker, there'd be a little bunker thing. And what would happen is when a Katusha rocket was being fired, we had these huge balloons up in the air. They would spot what's called the poo, the point of origin, and an alarm would go off. And then your job was to run as fast as you could and dive into one of these uh, 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 cement reinforced things, hold your head, you know, put your hands over your head and hope that uh, it wasn't going to hit you there or if it came too close and wasn't going to shatter your ear, eardrums. So I lived with that with a, for a year and a half. Anyone who's been at the American Embassy has many, many stories, probably far more stories than I have. So what happened was up in Tikrit, which is further up, and again, there are these uh, Shia militia groups operating on their own. And what has happened over the past few years is the, the Iraqi government has never really consolidated power. And when a government fails to consolidate power, often power flows to these non-governmental organizations, including these Shia militia groups that are heavily supported financially by the Iranians. And so one of these groups fired a missile at a US base and killed an American contractor. Well, if you're, if you're Secretary Pompeo and you made your entire career on the idea that Secretary Clinton was 100% responsible for Chris Stevens' decision to go to Benghazi, you don't want to see Americans being killed if for no other reason than you just uh, went after the, uh, your predecessor, uh, Secretary Clinton, and you don't want to put yourself in the same position. So the decision was to go after these guys in a way that, frankly, hadn't been done before. We killed about 26 of them. And then the issue came, well, what else can we do? Qasem Soleimani made one of his brazen trips through the airport, and we know that he's done that. The Israelis have known it. Everyone's known it for years. And they went after him, and they killed him. And so he, he again, was, is not living in a cave, and he's not making his own foreign policy. He's getting it from the Ayatollahs, but he was particularly good at it and creative and uh, vicious. And so I don't rule the day that he's gone, but I'm not sure our government really thought through the process of what next. So um, with him gone, his successor was immediately named, and attacks on the embassy have continued. But the uh, Trump administration has decided not to retaliate, because often retaliating, you make it even worse. That was certainly the lesson from before. But this is going on as we speak. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there were huge demonstrations in Iraq against what has essentially been a rather feckless governmental structure. When I was there, we had this uh, strong man that I mentioned, uh, uh, Nader, uh, uh, Nuri al-Maliki. Um, he was finally replaced by a guy, a guy named uh, uh, Haider al-Alamri. But Haider uh, also didn't have enough support he was replaced by a sort of technical, technical guy uh, who, um, um, God, I'm forgetting the names as I stand up here, but it doesn't matter unless you're taking notes. Uh, so um, he, he was by Adil Abdomekdi, excuse me. And so Adil Abdomekdi resigned a couple of months ago. And now the question is, who's coming next? There's a guy named Alawi who was, uh, when I was there, was a communications, uh, the telephone guy. Uh, and he's now going to be the prime minister. His, his mandate is to get people who are not affiliated with any of the uh, political parties in the, uh, in the uh, Council of Representatives, their, their Congress, and that he has to go out and get people who are really technical people who have no party affiliation. Well, as they say, good luck on that one, because uh, Everyone in Iraq has a party affiliation. So uh, the betting, I was just reading Al Monitor. And if you're ever looking for a good kind of magazine that, uh, or online journal that kind of can give you a lot of the inside baseball in places like Iran, Iraq, it's called Al Monitor. Um, just Google it. And, and uh, so I was just checking on how that's going. He's probably not going to last long, very long. And what you may get is some of these Shia militia groups will put someone forward. Uh, meanwhile, the Iranians um, 
really don't know what to do about this. Uh, the common American view that the Iranians like chaos in Iraq really is not true. Some Ir Iranians like chaos in Iraq, but most Iranians, especially their government, would like it calmed down so it would play the role of a good buffer state and keep them well aware away from any sort of organized Sunni attacks. So the Iranians are uh, kind of keeping their heads down for now. Uh, my own view is we've not seen the end of retribution for Qasem Soleimani's uh, uh, death. And um, at some point, we're going to need a political process. Well, uh, it's hard to have diplomacy when you fire all the diplomats. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, our president has, I think, wisely said, I, I'm not interested in forever wars. And he's been bringing people back. He's been bringing people back from Syria. He's been bringing people back from a number of places. In fact, they, they want to bring all our troops back from Africa, which is another place where we've been battling terrorism there. But the president does seem to like to have forever wars against things like the Justice Department and the State Department. And so uh, it is not at all clear whether we are going to be set up for dealing with a problem that requires some subtlety of thought and uh, some real thinking skills. So uh, with that kind of downbeat ending, uh, we can go to some questions. Thank you very much. Good evening. I just had a question. What do you think about the recent boycott Saudi Arabia has on Qatar? Well, all the Gulf countries yeah. have on Qatar. They're actually building a US Air Force base there. Well, now, in to try Qatar. To, yeah, in Qatar, trying to protect themselves because yeah. the army's there. But I've yeah. lived in the Gulf for 30 years, so I see Saudi Arabia as the biggest threat at this time. Yeah. Um, first of all, they, there has been a base in Doha for some time. I mean, I toured it. It's got F-16s, the works. Uh, Qatar has been a pretty good, uh, um, you know, partner of ours in the Middle East. Not great because we have disagreements, and some of the disagreements we have with Qatar are the same dis disagreements the Saudis have. The fundamental disagreement the Saudis have with Qatar is Qatar refused to join the Gulf Cooperation Council and refused to join uh, sort of Saudi structures that enshrine Saudi leadership. Qatar is a bit of an upstart, and they say, hey, we can handle this ourselves. We don't need you Saudis to tell us what to do. So that's kind of problem number one in terms of uh, how the Saudis look at it. Problem number two, however, is the Qatar has continued to support a sect of Sunnism called Muslim Brotherhood. Now, we know about Muslim Brotherhood because of its uh, 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 leadership in, um, in uh, Cairo, of course, it ended up in a military coup and they were all put in prison. But it's very much of a, um, of a radical Sunni uh, uh, perspective in the Levant, in the uh, western part of the Middle East. Uh, and, the, uh, Qatar and the Qataris have been supportive of it over the years. Now, you would think that the Saudis would like the Muslim Brotherhood, after all, uh, the Saudis also have supported uh, uh, very um, radicalized Sunni or versions of Sunnism, but that's different. What they are, they support is something called Salafist radicalism, and uh, the big difference of Saudi radicalism and uh, Muslim Brotherhood is Muslim Brotherhood, even though they're Sunnis, have actually had good relations or reasonable relations with uh, Iran. Uh, Qatar, in particular, has had good relations with Iran, sharing some of the oil and gas, and otherwise having pretty good uh, economic and commercial uh, uh, connections there. And the Saudis have never accepted that proposition. But it does go back to the Salafist versus uh, Muslim Brotherhood divide, and also the fact that the uh, Qatari never really played ball and accepted Saudi. Uh, they, they think of, if you think of the Saudis, forgive me for this because it's probably more complicated than it's worth, but if you think of the Saudis as the Soviet Union and you think of these uh, Gulf Council states as sort of Eastern European satellites, and then if you think of Qatar as the one satellite that said, no, we're not playing ball, sort of Yugoslavia, if you will, uh, uh, you can see they don't like the example that this uh, that the Qatari have uh, have set. <laughs>
it's complicated. Yeah, are, are the are the Iranians looking to us as trying to do regime regime change? Yeah. Is that is that is that really the goal of the administration? Is to get rid of Khomeini yeah. and yeah. The, you know, the theocratic yeah. leadership? Yeah. I mean, normally when an administration conducts some hardball politics, uh, at some point you want the president to get up and say what it is we're doing. Uh, we don't have that. Uh, but in the absence of that, and uh, certainly inspired by a lot of kind of off-the-cuff comments by our Secretary of State and leaks to the press, et cetera, one could reasonably conclude that our objective with Iran is to change the regime. Uh, the president has said we don't want to do that, but he should therefore tell his Secretary of State that that's his policy because the Secretary of State, Mr. Pompeo from neighboring Kansas, uh, is very much a proponent of the idea that we need to weaken them, starve them, and eventually force them to their knees. I think we have forced that we, during the Obama administration, they forced them to the table with some of these economic measures. I don't think we're gonna force them to their knees. They are very, the Iranians, whatever you think of them, are, you know, been around for 4,000 years and they don't do everything they're told to do. Next question, please. Okay. Thanks for being here, Ambassador Hill. This has been great. If we could go back to 2011, when American forces were withdrawn from Iraq, I think I've got that right. Yeah. What, what was the influence of Iran over the Iraq government at that time yeah. to encourage yeah. America to leave Iraq? Yeah. Uh, I have, you, you get different people with different takes on it. And I have, I think, a minority take on this. And the majority take on this is that um, there was Iranian uh, influence on the Maliki government and the Iranians encouraged the Maliki government to be so tough on the, uh, on the conditions for remaining or for keeping the troops there that, uh, uh, that the um, Americans under President Obama, who wanted to be able to show at the, the elections in 2012, said, okay, if you're going to be like that, we're out of here. So that's kind of, you, you hear that argument from a lot of people, and frankly, it's a lot of, you know, I understand it. There's, it's not without foundation. My own take, is, however, is somewhat different. Uh, the Iranians didn't like Maliki any more than anybody else did. I mean, maybe Mrs. Maliki likes Maliki, <laughs> but I doubt it. Uh, Maliki was a pain in the neck to everybody. And I do remember when I was there reading the intel that the Iranians had a sort of ABM, uh, anybody but Maliki uh, approach. And they wanted... Um, you know, the Sadrists based more in Basra. They wanted actually someone from Iski, uh, even though Iski, uh, which is, uh, uh, they're kind of allied with, uh, with uh, Ayatollah Sistani, but also they have their own political party. And the last people they wanted were uh, uh, Maliki's, uh, Maliki's party. Uh, after one person, after the next went down, they ended up, there was only one person left standing. And this was an argument I had with a lot of Americans who uh, said, well, why can't we get uh, uh, um, Alawi, who is a, uh, a Shia, but much more allied with the Sunnis? Isn't that brilliant? We'll get our Shia leadership there, and, but he'll kind of bring the Sunnis in in a way that none of these real Shia have brought the Sunnis in, and won't this be brilliant? Well, that's great, but Ayat Alawi was never there. Uh, you know, uh, I like to say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Maliki went to work after the elections in 2010, and Alawi went on CNN to uh, complain about Maliki. So I don't think there was ever a chance of that happening. And, uh, you know, we went through all these crazy efforts to get a role for Alawi on the theory that he would bring in Sunni power, et cetera. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is about Iranians, not about stupid Americans. And uh, I, you know, I was kind of appalled listening to so-called Middle East experts saying that, well, we can engineer getting rid of a, 
uh, the sitting prime minister and bring in someone else that none of the other Iranian er, Iraqis seem to want. All that is a long explanation for saying the Iranians didn't really like Maliki, but Maliki is a you know ear to the ground politician, and he knew that if he allowed the Americans to stay uh, without um, with uh, and to have immunity from prosecution in Iraqi courts. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want my son deployed there where he didn't have immunity from Iraqi uh, court actions. Uh, but that was, that was what the Iraqis were insisting on. And I don't think President Obama had a choice there. I mean, can you imagine going to the Congress and say, well, we're, the good news is we're keeping our troops in, in Iraq. The bad news is uh, if one of them jaywalks, he ends up in front of a, uh, an Iraqi judge. And I don't think anyone would, would accept that proposition. The other point, which I felt was valid, was that those forces came as our forces, who had been continually there since the spring of 2003, were an invasion force. And having lived in Eastern Europe, where the Soviets invaded those countries, and then insisted those countries sign a peace treaty with them, like we welcome your invaders in our country, well, it didn't work for Poland, and it didn't work for anybody. And for us to basically be doing the same thing with the Iraqis wasn't going to work either. So, uh, so I thought the right approach was to say, OK, we'll pull out. And if you want us back, you can invite us back, but we're out. Um, the problem, and, and by the way, the, the American forces by that point were riveted out in deserts. We had some anti-terrorism uh, activity going on, but nothing on the level of, uh, on the, the knee, uh, of the equipment and training that we would have needed to go after ISIS, which was a very fast building force coming out of Syria. And that's another point. These guys were coming out of the badlands of Syria. They were not places where our troops were in a position to deal with them. So uh, I think it's kind of a bad rap on, on Obama. And uh, what Obama eventually did was to say to the Iraqis, OK, we're back in. And it was interesting how the Iraqis didn't start talking about that, that issue of jurisdiction, you know, the so-called status of forces agreement. They said, no, please, come in. We need you. Big difference when you invite someone than when someone invades you. Um, so I th and President Obama was pretty quick to bring them in. With one exception, he told the Iraqis, I want this guy Maliki gone. And that took several months, because Maliki was, you know, again, a real pain in the neck. And I think President Obama said, I don't want to deal with this guy anymore. And if we're going to bring in our troops, we need a more reader, reasonable uh, uh, leadership in Iraq. And I, I think that's the more accurate thing. We'll have to wait till the history books sort it out. You didn't mention John Bolton in your talk. Um, I didn't? <laughs> what an omission. I, I, uh, I, I think a lot of people yeah. thought when Bolton left. I'm sorry, who's asking the question? Oh, there you are. Okay. When Bolton left the administration, that it might signal a softening of the administration toward uh, uh, Iran. That yeah. obviously wasn't the case. And I'm wondering yeah. if you have any insight into what went on with between Trump and Bolton and what that was about. You know, I, we'll have to wait for Bolton's book, uh, <laughs> which is stuck in clearance in the White House. Because the White House is very concerned about whether he's mentioned any classified items, so they're just giving it a real scrub. Uh, um, I think Bolton, uh, he's impossible to work with. I, I mean, I tried to work with him in North Korea, and uh, he, uh, he never quits. He never gives up. Uh, some people think that's an attribute. I, I think, you know, you ought to, you know, I'm sounding like Russell Crowe and gladiator, but you ought to know when you're beaten. And, uh, and he didn't seem to know that. And the thing is, uh, when, when Bolton doesn't get his way, he goes, you know, he tries another path and, you know, he'll go out and leak you to death with other, you know, with uh, uh, right-wing media or he'll go to the Congress. He's, he's kind of hard to work with. And I think the president basically concluded that. Uh, however, um, you know, so I don't have a lot good to say about him, but, uh, but I don't think he, he was in favor of taking a very fragile uh, country like Ukraine uh, 
with an incoming, uh, an incoming president who was a professional comedian, which I guess is one way to get through life, uh, and then uh, to demand from him dirt on your political opponent, I think Bolton just wasn't comfortable with that. Uh, don't know why, but he just wasn't comfortable with that. And, uh, and I think uh, a lot of people are not, including many of my colleagues, who I am extremely proud of for what people like Masha Yovanovitch did and Bill Taylor, and they will be remembered. So you always wish, hope, that if you're ever in that position, you'll do the right thing. Uh, and you know, Masha and Bill sure did, and others there. And you know, let's give the devil his due. Maybe uh, Bolton did the right thing too, because what seems to be, you know, he had a lot of rivalry with with um, with Pompeo, and not that Pompeo advocated a soft line on Iran or something, but yeah, there was a lot of rivalry there, uh, and uh, you know, it was kind of a dysfunctional relationship. I think the president got a little tired of it. Uh, but I think uh, Pompeo is more important to the president than John Bolton was. So I think that's how it got played out. I have a question way back, yeah. way back here. Uh, Ronan Farrow has written a book um, entitled War on Peace. Yeah. Uh, I've seen he, it. Yeah. He was in the State Department, but yeah. he, he um, was concerned about the lessened role of the State Department and diplomacy versus yeah. the rise of yeah. militarism and such. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I haven't read the whole book. I'm in it, so I did the Washington read. I went to the index and, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, I mean, good for him uh, that he did this. Uh, there's a lot of very poignant stuff about his relationship with Holbrook, who I also had a very close relationship with. Uh, but I think his bottom line and what he chronicled was the, uh, the fact that uh, those days and weeks right after the uh, uh, Trump administration came in and the haste with which they got rid of, uh, of uh, career foreign service, as I said, Trump uh, is conducting a sort of forever war against these people. And uh, he uh, and, you know, friends of mine were just summarily fired. And, uh, and you know, people back the president by saying, well, he has a right to have his own team there. Yes, he does, but you know, there's a way you do that, and you don't just fire people like that. And you know, it's just kind of disgraceful. And I think uh, uh, Farrow uh, has chronicled some of the early days of it, and I think those have informed what's happened more recently, including to Masha and Bill and others. Uh, I think he, he uh, provided a great service. I think he's a pretty amazing journalist. He looks about 12 years old, by the way. And uh, I remember when I first met him, I, I, I said to Holbrook, you've got to be kidding me. Where are you getting these people? And uh, the guy is really smart, very smart. And he's older than he looks. Uh, but uh, he, uh, uh, he, he's good. And uh, I just hope, I just hope that I don't know when the Trump administration will end. Uh, and the Bernie Sanders, uh, well, never mind. Uh, but uh, I just hope the professional services hang in there. Uh, this is really tough. I mean, we are getting people now in the State Department who you know, have no business being there. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. And I'm deeply worried about this, and we should all be worried about it. You know, when I look at this, uh, this. Iran special uh, negotiator. He's never met an Iranian. You know, it's just a joke. And, uh, you know, these people need to understand that, you know, since the dawn of history, you have to talk to your enemies. You have to keep the door open. You have to uh, be willing to do it. And not just as a reality TV show, as it's been with the North Koreans, but rather for, you know, a real effort to try to find what are the root causes of our disagreement and how can we, how can we fix it. And these people don't have a clue but I don't want to get too political here. <laughs> Former Senator um, Jim Webb of Virginia remarked of his experience in Lebanon as a junior officer in yeah. uh, 1983 and 1984 that there's no sense in getting into a five-way fight that's been going on for 2,000 years. Yeah, yeah. 
what would happen if we just totally pulled out of Iraq? Yeah. Um, I don't know, which makes me nervous in and of itself. Uh, I think uh, the Iraqis would eventually sort things out. The question is whether in the meantime you would have a, um, a general war in the Middle East uh, between the Shia, supported by Shia Iran, but also Shia and the various uh, Sunni-led countries, uh, whether it would be a terrible bloodbath, uh, whether it would interrupt oil supplies for most of the world. I mean, we're not dependent on them, and I think that is a fact that is informing our policy. We're not as dependent on Middle East oil as we used to be. But um, I don't think we have to, quote, withdraw. I don't see why we have to have the military there everywhere. I like the idea of having the military there to deal with counterterrorism issues, but I really have a question about uh, having the military there to do nation building, which uh, we got into in Iraq. And I don't think we're very good at that, and I think that ought to, we ought to cease and desist. But I think we ought to be players, bigger players than we are, and I think it's in our interest to be bigger players than we are there. And I think that's a, a function of our of diplomacy, which uh, we don't have enough of right now. So, um, and as for um, Senator Webb, a Republican, by the way, uh, he was uh, the head of the East Asia subcommittee in the Senate, um, and I used to see him fairly frequently. And uh, I invited him over to the East Asia Bureau at the State Department, come to our conference room, and I, I made it a sort of all hands on deck thing. Uh, everyone had to be there, and it was pretty terrific. And then, for then, I learned something about uh, Republican politics. I went to. Secretary Rice, I said, could you just come down and say hello for a minute? Because uh, I have James Webb, and she said, well, why do you have him there? <laughs> I said, oh, okay, hey, you know, he's our subcommittee, and she kind of reluctantly came down and, you know, looked enthused to see him, but she wasn't. So uh, I, I knew that he was a bit of an odd man out, even at that time, as a, as a, as a uh, Republican. Okay, I always worry about last questions, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> Is the United States still giving money to the Iraq government? Well, no. Uh, we haven't, quote, given them money in a long time. We did, uh, we gave them money at the time to help, uh, help them, you know, help their finance ministry start acting like a finance ministry. We gave money early on to help them... Uh, you know, they, they had the, the Sunni insurrection, and these Sunnis were killing Americans. And so the effort, it was part of something called the surge, uh, which is way, uh, I mean, there's a lot of revisionism about that, but it was an effort to get these Sunni militia groups and to put them into being a sort of territory or local defense for the Iraqis, even though their job was killing Shia. Uh, so by giving them money and getting them as part of the Iraqi uh, defense establishment, we kind of defanged that whole process and made them part of the Iraqi army for what it was worth. Uh, so we did that for a while until the Iraqis understood they had to pay for that themselves. Uh, in terms of, quote, giving them money, I don't think you'll see too much of that. Uh, we may, you know, when you look at a foreign assistance budget, you go, well, what are we doing here? Where's this money going? And often what it is, is you're, you've got uh, five people that are from our Treasury Department, and they go out to the Ministry of Finance, and they work in the Ministry of Finance, and they help them with their various things, and we pay for it. Uh, and I think it's money well spent. Uh, what was happening in Iraq, however, was that uh, our, uh, the regular assistance provided by the Agency for International Development became smaller and smaller because I think the American people were saying, wait a minute, this is an oil producing country. Why are we giving them money, even though a lot of the money was to you know, help give technical assistance, help get people into their various ministries to help them. But the real bucks, the real money was coming from something called SERP, which was the Commander's Emergency Response Program, SERP. And what that was, was, was a lot of money and cash. So how did that work? Well, let's say you got a problem out in some little province, 
somewhere, and some sheikh's people, uh, uh, local potentates, his, his, his uh, militias, and a lot of these local militias are under the local sort of strong man of the region, and they've been taking pot shots at our troops. So you go to the sheikh and say, sheikh, here's some money. Now, I'll give you this money, and you know, you say, what do you want? You go, well, I want a, I don't know, a fence for my goats. Perfect. Here's money for your fence for your goats, but uh, no more shooting at our guys. If there's more shooting at our guys, no money. Okay, so do we understand, here's some money, but you gotta stop your shooting at our guys. So it's, what's it called? It's force protection money. Uh, and uh, force protection money, uh, it goes as a regular military uh, expenditure. And if some congressman were to say, now wait a minute, that sounds like a assistance to the Iraqis, sounds like bribes given to the Iraqis, someone else would say, hey, that's to protect our boys. And uh, that congressman would shut up in a hurry. That stuff has been going on since the dawn of history. And uh, I would say, you know, money as a weapon of war is nothing new. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Hill.